I am going to shift your focus a little bit from business to your personal life and uh, chat to you about estate planning for a digital world and why traditional rules are not keeping pace with our fast moving digital world and digital lives that we live. So just to give you some background um, as to how we, we started thinking about this and what made us realize that we're not approaching estate planning perhaps in the best way we could and not considering how, how things are changing so dramatically. So I'm sure that you've all heard the term big data. Now that term was coined just due to the amount of data which changes hands on a daily basis you know, from individuals to companies and vice versa. And in fact, there's an interesting statistic and that is that in the period 2012 to 2014, more data was produced by humans than in all of human civilization before that. So that just gives you an indication and that's four years ago. So you can just imagine you know, with the technology changes that have come in, how that's even, even more so today. So our data footprint and, and our digital presence is ever growing, as is the amount of information which we store digitally. So I wonder if any of you have ever given thought to what you may do with this information and this data which, which you hold on yourself and you know, may have a business purpose as well, and whether you would deal with that in your wills or whether you would leave it to future generations. Our law is quite good at dealing with physical assets and paper documents, but it's not so good at looking at the digital side of things. So that's where we see that we need to make a change and there needs to be a mindset change as to how we approach estate planning. So traditional estate planning is something I'm sure most of you are familiar with and that would be taking into account your traditional assets, which is your house, your car, your business, shares you may own, and then putting that into a structured um, document which would also take into account any tax effects and the like. So we'd be looking at using wills and trusts and all of that to make it the, the most efficient structure whilst taking into account your wishes and of course ensuring that your loved ones are looked after. So that will would then be drafted and signed and it would just deal with those specific assets. It would never take into account your digital assets. I'll get to what those may be shortly, I'm sure that's the question you're going to ask. Also, our digital assets are not dealt with in any, any South African legislation. Interestingly, the US has some legislation which allows um, an executor to deal with social media sites and email accounts and the like, but we just haven't gotten to that point as yet. Um, I hope that day will come, but um, for now we can still deal with it in our own way. So what do we mean by digital assets? These can be um, assets which have a monetary value or may just have a sentimental value. So it could be things like your social media accounts, your Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, it could be your LinkedIn account. It would be your digital photos and music. Most of us have replaced traditional photo albums with online photo albums, restoring photos on Dropbox and the like. It could be your computer hardware. If you can't actually get into a computer where everything's stored, you know, what good is the information that's held there? Uh, for those who own um, websites, there could be domain names which are your property, which wouldn't traditionally be dealt with in a world. Then there's um, other information stored electronically. This would, again, be something like Dropbox. Then a new one is cryptocurrency wallets. You know, there's this, been this big boom of Bitcoin, but not many people are thinking of how to deal with that in your estate. And lastly, something like an online share trading platform. That could be like an easy equities account or the like. So there are some options for the handling of your digital assets which are already built into terms and conditions which you would have agreed to when you took up uh, you know, your account on Facebook and the like. So I've set out there some of the options which are immediately available to you, but of course you can always provide in a digital will what you would like to happen to your information and what you would like to happen to those accounts. So on Facebook and Instagram being one and the same really, you can memorialize or delete your Facebook account but you'd need to leave someone instructions that that's what your intentions were. On Facebook, you can also appoint legacy contacts who could look after your Facebook page when you're no longer around. Um, emails, generally, you can only delete accounts, but this is somewhat of a problem when it comes to dealing with an estate because there's a lot of information stored on emails. It could be invoices, there could be crucial information and the like, which you can't get to unless you instruct someone how to get to that information. LinkedIn also only allows for the deletion of a profile. So as I've said there, you can allow your digital um, executive to access these accounts and we'll show you how to do that. So what is the importance of digital estate planning? So just to give you a little bit of an example, and this most likely wouldn't apply to most of us, um, 
Daniel Middleton, who is, or he was the number one YouTube owner for 2017, earned 16 and a half million US dollars last year and has 19.2 million subscribers to his channel. Now this definitely isn't a traditional asset. Whilst you could deal with the income from his YouTube channel and any assets he purchased in his traditional will, um, he wouldn't have dealt with what is to happen to his channel after his demise. Is someone to access it? Is it to be closed down? You know, you may want that channel to keep running because those uh, videos would still get hits and they'd still be ad revenue. So it's something different to think about. These are sort of intangible assets and it requires a new way of thinking from both the individual and the estate planner. A few more uh, points, you know, regarding the importance of digital estate planning. We, we say that it makes it a little bit easier for the um, executors and the family if you stipulate what your intentions are regarding your digital assets, and of course, if they could access information which may be necessary to help speed up that process. It could prevent identity theft. You know, if you take control of these online accounts, there's so much identity theft and fraud going on at the moment, you could prevent some of that happening if you close down accounts or notify the correct persons. And again, you'd need to stipulate your wishes. To avoid losing your story and to pass on your story to future generations. I think this could be one of the most important things. As I mentioned, you know, your photos and that are no longer stored in albums. So if you'd want your children and your grandchildren and their children to be able to, you know, access those photos and be able to, you know, look back on that and look back on your story, then you'd need to give someone access. And uh, I think that's, that's crucial. Also, preventing the wrong person from coming across private information. If it is your wish that an email account be closed and no one else have access because they don't want you you know, to have access to those sorts of accounts. You need to stipulate it some way, otherwise someone is going to guess what your intentions may be and, you know, act on that. So I alluded to cryptocurrencies earlier. So these are interesting because there are two sides to them. They are traditional assets in a way because they have uh, value, but the way in which you access them is not traditional. So they are typically, typically held in wallets online. And you would need to give someone access to these wallets in order to actually deal with these accounts. We had an estate um, where it was by accident discovered that there was cryptocurrency and we had to deal with it. That was the first of its kind for us. Um, so earlier on in the process, when you're looking at your traditional estate planning, um, you would ordinarily look at the tax effect. So you'd look at estate duty and capital gains and income tax. And then of course, what the liquidity consequences are of those different taxes. But if it's never brought to the attention of the attorney or the financial planner who's involved in the estate planning, that will not be taken into account. And some people have substantial uh, cryptocurrency holdings and it could throw th things out quite substantially. So that's the traditional side. But then of course, if you're not aware of the asset and you cannot access that asset, um, heirs are missing out on a lot of value which you would intend to actually pass down to them. So it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid asset if I could put it that way. So we should be considering these things, particularly um, in this time of cryptocurrencies and you know, alternative assets. So there's a lot of hype at the moment about privacy laws. Um, we have our new Protection of Personal Information Act, which is partly enforceable, but will be fully enforceable at a later stage, as well as worldwide privacy laws and regulations, most notably now in the EU. Um, so you'd think you could rely on these sorts of things to keep your assets private even after your death. But in fact, these regulations and laws only apply to living persons. So again, you'd want to stipulate what is to happen to your assets. Do you want someone to have access or do you not? And if you don't, ensure you write that down so it can be dealt with. If you would like someone to have access, same thing really. There is some comfort, although privacy laws don't specifically apply, with a lot of these types of assets, you've got the terms and conditions as I alluded to, and um, those would stipulate that no one else can have access to your account. Um, they will not grant access without a court order effectively. So you have a little bit of comfort there, but it can make things difficult if there's an urgent situation where you would require access. So sort of wrapping it all up and, and explaining how you could actually deal with this. We talked about you know, the importance and, and what you should look at in life, but how do you actually sort out your digital estate plan? So it shouldn't be siloed, it should be part of your estate planning as a whole. So you should look at the traditional and the digital estate planning together um, so that you're not missing out on any assets and you're seeing the bigger picture. So the best way to go about looking at your digital assets and what you may like to happen to them 
is to do a personal audit of these assets. Look at what you hold, you know, your different social media accounts, where you hold your photos, um, emails and the like, and record those. Document the usernames and passwords, particularly if you would like someone to have access. Then you could identify a digital executor. This wouldn't necessarily have to be the same as your traditional executor, because often that's a, a company. You know, it could be a bank, it could be a, a normal corporation who deals with the estates. And uh, you wouldn't particularly want that person to have access to all your personal information. It's just not appropriate and it, it's, it's sort of missing the point in a way. So you'd want someone who you trust and who's close to you. And of course, someone who understands technology because some of it could get a bit interesting. Um, then you would need to record your wishes in relation to each type of asset. So this is where we say draw up a digital assets will. It's, it can be part of your traditional will, but again, it's going to contain sensitive information and a will becomes public information at some point. So you may want this document separate. So you record each of your assets or wishes in relation to each of your assets and you could attach then an addendum which stipulates the passwords and usernames for those assets which you'd like someone to access. And then of course, in terms of storing that digital will as well as the passwords and usernames, you have to think quite carefully as to where you do that. There are a few online platforms or storage services which you could use, but you would have to be certain as to the security level and I mean, we all have to be conscious that uh, they have to take necessary steps to protect your information. Or you could go back to a, an old-fashioned way of storing things and that would be under lock and key in a file cabinet or a safe. But at all times, be aware of, risk, of the risks of storing this sort of information. If you are concern that is compromised or someone has gained unauthorized access, you would of course have to take the necessary steps to change those passwords and the like. So that's really what, it, what we look at when we do our digital estate planning. We record the separate will and we have our traditional will looking at all the assets, including your cryptocurrencies and um, those uh, sort of assets with a monetary value. So in conclusion, I'd just like to say, next time you uh, you review a will, or if you haven't got a will, the next time you draft a will, take into consideration your digital assets and whether you have specific wishes in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Yes. So, sorry. Once again, um, if I have a digital asset, yes, and it resides on a server mm -hmm. somewhere on the planet, yes, under which jurisdiction would that asset reside? Um, it generally would be stipulated in the terms and conditions for that service provider, but it's often in the jurisdiction where that service is. So if I have got a digital asset in yes. Canada, yes. Um, and I have a estate in South Africa, yes. firstly, let's say you're aware of it. Yeah. Uh, well, you being my estate planner, let's yes. say. Yes. Uh, how do I get the two together? Well, that's where you'd want your digital executor to, to go and deal with those assets on your behalf. So you'd, you'd raise it with your estate planner at the time, but you'd appoint but, someone but who knows about it. But then I'm I'm gone. You know, well, that's I'm why you, yeah, you want to record it in that digital asset world. You'd record that particular asset. But these laws will govern that asset. So it would most likely be Canada. Um, and I've, I've used Canada as an example. Let's use Hong Kong. It would be their rules, but it depends on the type of asset and what you want to be done with that, that asset. And you'd have to fall within the bounds of what those terms and conditions allow, for instance. Yes. Yes, correct. <coughs> On the topic of, of, um, of wallets and cryptocurrencies yes. and things like that, why on earth would you want anybody to know? I would rather give access to it to my husband or my children mm -hmm. and my children. Let's, let's be honest. Tax free. Tax free. Why will you now want to pay estate duty on him? on something that nobody should actually know about. Well, of course, but as, as an estate planner or an attorney or a financial planner, you, you have to advise your clients that um, you need to abide by those laws and it would have to be taken into account for estate duty purposes. So, yes, if you don't advise someone, they wouldn't know about it and it could possibly Ignorance, happen, but yes. it's not, it's obviously not advised. Or you have to spell out the options, you know, if you tell me about it, this is the taxation that will apply, if you don't tell me about it, there will be no taxation. So make up your own mind. <laughs> One way to break. <laughs> Alright. Perfect. Any other questions? How easy is it to 
memorialize a Facebook site? It's very easy. So if you have a legacy contact, it's even easier. So that's someone that you'd appoint um, during your lifetime, and that could be one of your Facebook contacts, and it actually lets them know that they are your uh, legacy contact. You would let them know what your wishes are, and it's literally a matter of writing to Facebook. You address an email, and they will memorialize it. They verify the death effectively, and then it's memorialized. So it's, it's a straightforward process. It takes a week. And does the same apply to, to Twitter and LinkedIn? And well, Twitter patterns? doesn't have a memorializing option. They would terminate your account after a period of inactivity, otherwise you could close your account. So that's why I say the different um, service providers, if I put it that way, have different terms and conditions and different rules which apply. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to go outside of those, aside from allowing someone access just to download the necessary information. I've actually seen where family members would um, Thank you <clears throat> on a Facebook post and just say Santa passed away this morning. Yeah. And that's usually the last <clears throat> activity. Yeah, so so a legacy contact um, can also post on behalf of that person if I'm not mistaken. Um, but they can't change previous posts and, and that sort of thing. So they could post on that person's page as a legacy contact. So it could be something like that as well. But just on that as well. I think if you leave that Facebook page open, mm -hmm. um, generally your friends, etc., are then advised of your birthday yeah. and you have passed away. So I think you want to avoid that sort of incident happening because it's, it can be quite painful or, or quite freaky in a way to suddenly receive a notification of somebody's <laughs> birthday and you know they passed away last year. So I think. You know, one needs to think yeah. about that because we, we tended to forget about it. Um, but these things do happen. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's good that, that, that we become aware of it and start realizing where we actually store our information and what we do with it. Um, I, I haven't sort of quite got my mind around emails and, and those sorts of things, but pictures certainly because your laptop, for example, if you don't use it for a period of time, it, it then becomes very difficult to access and, um, you know, maybe the software is out of date, etc. or it breaks down completely. And again, I think those photos have a certain, um, have a lot of sentimental value, let's put it that way, because there's no other record of you as a person or as a couple or whatever the case might be. So you've got to do something with them and you haven't always given them to somebody else. They sit on your own server. Uh, of, of course, you have to update your passwords yes. continuously. That's it. At the rate that I change passwords, <laughs> yeah. it's exactly. I can't that. even remember. I have a special file that says passwords, where I put all the new passwords because I, I can't remember them. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. So it is something you have to be aware of. As I say, if you have to change your passwords for any reason. You have to make note of that. And also just to let your digital executor know where to find that document and where to find the passwords. So it's a it's a quite a discussion to be had with that person and to explain exactly where everything is and how to access everything. Yeah. yeah. What's the average cost in the moment digital executor? There isn't uh, there isn't a cost there. So with traditional executors you rely on the administration of the state act, but there is no like act for digital assets and it hasn't been incorporated in there. So that's something that's still to be, I'd say, challenged or thought about. Um, so it, it wouldn't certainly be as much work as a normal executor. Um, and if it were your normal executor, for instance, you appointed a spouse or a parent or uh, a sibling as an executor, then it would form part and parcel of that role effectively, so they would be working. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kezia. Um, and obviously that's a whole new take and a whole new discussion. It's something that most of us haven't even thought about. Um, certainly it was something that I faced when my husband died almost two years ago. And that's why I mentioned the question of a Facebook page. You leave it open. And people can still post on there and communicate to that person and you effectively want to stop that because let's face it, not everybody knows what, ha what happens. Somebody who's less or more remote um, 
there are there are issues around that. So I think it's it's very interesting and it it's um, it raises a topic that we're living in a different world in a different era and we need to approach it and look at things from a different point of view. I think we've had a very interesting morning. I must say we've had a very wide range um, of topics um, and expertise that's been shared with us. Thank you to all of those presenters. Caroline is still here and Kizia is here and I think that's the only two that are still left here. But um, we've really enjoyed it. I hope you have. Please just complete the questionnaire as I say it will help us. Our next event is on the 26th of July. I know that Mark Schussler, the economist, is going to be one of the speakers. Um, we're trying to get a variety of speakers and what I'd like to do specifically for those of you who are Institute members is to pass the message on to peers and um, colleagues, um, anybody that you come across. It is a free event as you well know and uh, we'd like to certainly see more, more members um, attending, those that are in the Johannesburg area. One of the questions that we have asked is the starting time, whether we should leave it as is um, at 9 for 9.30 or whether we should move it to 8 for 8.30. Um, and we'll see what the, the general consensus is around that. Um, obviously it has a lot to do with traffic and um, whether you go to the office first or go to the office afterwards. But thank you again for the time and I think there are still some uh, there is still some tea and coffee and some snacks if you want to avail yourself of those. And thank you and hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>